Hi, and welcome to episode five of our Drawing Your Path to Success video series. I'm Darren Vaughn, the Communications Director for the New Mexico Department of Game and Fish. And I know that we said that uh, Tony Opatz was going to be our next episode, but uh, thanks to some weather and some rescheduling, we're actually here with uh, Oren DeVouvier, our uh, Deer Program Manager. So uh, looking forward to our, our chat today about all things deer. Um, so just a, a few housekeeping items. We've got some, some major deadlines coming up. Uh, March 22nd, obviously, is the big one. Uh, it's the uh, the deadline for getting all of your dry applications in. Uh, Got to have them in by 5 o'clock for, uh, for all of the uh, remaining big game species. Also, your uh, harvest reports for deer, elk, pronghorn, and turkey have to be in, or all of your dry applications will be rejected. Nobody wants to have that happen, so make sure you get those in. Um, for uh, Barbary, Ibex, Javelina, and Oryx, and also uh, for Trapper license holders, that uh, deadline is April 7th. Um, our, our hunt forecasts for the various big game species are all available at magazine.state.nm.us. They came out as part of our January and February newsletters. So uh, as you get ready to apply for the draw, feel free to check those out. Uh, there's some good information in there. And uh, Oren here wrote the, uh, the deer forecast. And uh, so uh, what's new for deer hunters here in New Mexico this year? Yeah, thanks for having me, Darren, and thanks everybody for joining us today. Um, the big thing for deer this year, as with all big game species, is we no longer allow scopes on muzzle loaders. Mm -hmm. um, you can use scopes on muzzle loaders during the an illegal weapon season, but when it comes to the muzzle loader seasons, the DER 3 whatever, L 3 whatever, um, you can no longer use scopes on the muzzle loader. So that's the big thing. Otherwise, um, we made some license adjustments to some different units here and there, increased heart, or increased licenses in some units, decreased in others. Um, <clears throat> we did add a few hunts in the southwest for cows, white-tailed deer, in units 21 and 26. Those will be some exciting opportunities for some folks. And then we added a late-season archery hunt in units 7 and in units 9. Uh, that will be January 1 to 15. Um, mm -hmm. And then we also have an early archery hunt for deer in unit 27. We didn't have it previously, but now we have the September 1 to 24 archery hunt in unit 27. Um, and then the next big thing is, uh, as most folks know, we acquired the Elbar Wildlife Management Area in unit nine. And so we added a deer hunt in unit nine. I think it's 10 tags, I'd have to go and look. Um, but if I remember correctly, we, we added 10 tags, a rifle hunt of 10 tags in there in I want to say October, but um, I don't know the exact specifics off the top of my head. It's been a while since since I wrote that rule. But uh, yeah, those are the, the big adjustments for this upcoming season and the, the next four years. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I know that we've got a, a bunch of uh, different species and subspecies of deer, well, at least several species and subspecies. Uh, tell me a little bit about those, those species and subspecies that we have here in New Mexico and some of the differences between them. Yeah, <clears throat> New Mexico uh, is, is really cool um, in that we have two species of deer. We have mule deer and white-tailed deer, mm -hmm. but within those two species of deer, there's two additional subspecies for each mule deer and white-tailed deer. So for mule deer, we have the Rocky Mountain mule deer and then desert mule deer. And then for white-tailed deer, we have Taos white-tailed deer and Texas or Eastern white-tailed deer. Um, <clears throat> The Rocky mule deer, there's not a hard definitive line between where the Rockies end and the, the deserts begin. Uh, it's more of a gradient. It's an interbreeding population, so it's, it's more of a gradient. But um, you can kind of think of I-40 as about the cutoff for when Rockies, the Rocky subspecies starts tapering out and when the desert subspecies starts tapering in. Um, so north of I-40 would be considered Rockies in general, south of I-40 would be deserts. Um, with the white-tailed deer, the cow's white-tailed deer, excuse me, the cow's white-tailed deer are found in the, the boot heel in the Gila area, so the southwest portion of the state. And then the eastern or Texas white-tailed deer are found along river bottoms and drainages on the east, eastern half of the state. Um, mm -hmm. There are some eastern white-tailed deer in the Sandias and, and kind of there's been a few reports around Albuquerque and things like that, but 
those are more anomalies than established populations. Mm -hmm. Rather, the established populations of those eastern white-tailed deer are, again, river bottoms and along the eastern eastern half, um, mm -hmm. Rio Doso and, and over to the Texas border. Okay. Well, I guess that makes sense for uh, Texas white-tailed deer to be kind of closer to the Texas line. Right, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> And what are some of the most recent population estimates? I know that uh, deer are a little bit harder to, to keep count of than, uh, than, say, elk or something like that. Um, so what, what are some of those uh, estimates, and is the population kind of generally increasing, decreasing, or is it steady? Sure, yeah. They, they are a little more difficult to, to survey than elk just uh, because their body sizes are smaller. They're a little more cryptic uh, mm -hmm. than elk. Um, it's harder to back calculate the population because the antler growth forms aren't as consistent in deer as they are in elk uh, per age class. Yeah. Um, that being said, I, I tell folks and, and in my write-ups I say we have about 80 to 90,000 mule deer throughout the state. That's both for Rockies and deserts. Mm -hmm. And then for the white-tailed deer, I say around 10,000. <clears throat> Excuse me, around 10,000 deer. Um, and that's both for the eastern or Texas subspecies and the cows mm -hmm. subspecies. So, um, you asked if they're, if they're, what the population trajectories are, mm -hmm. um, in general for out, throughout the state, it's stable, but I always put the caveat that there are local variations. So for instance, the Southwest portion of the state has been in a multi-year drought. Most of the state's been in a drought, as we all know. Mm -hmm. The Southwest part of the state has been in a multi-year drought that's even worse than, than other parts of the state. So uh, the Southwest deer populations are a little bit lower currently, um, but that's kind of offset. When I say statewide population, that's offset because some of the Northern populations are increasing. So Although some localized populations or population segments are lower in some areas, they're higher in others, which uh, balances out that fluctuation. Mm -hmm. So as far as uh, like the moisture that we got during this most recent monsoon season, is it too soon to tell what kind of positive impact that may have had on the population? So it'll all depend on what this next monsoon season does. So for, for deer, um, it takes about two years of, of appropriate and timely rainfalls to see a population rebound. Um, so, so one year of increased rain that will improve neonate survival and fawn survival for that one year. Mm -hmm. um, but if those neonates and those fawn or those fawns don't survive to reproduce in the next year, and if they're off, if their fawns then don't survive, so so basically, if if the fawns this year don't survive till next year. And then if they don't reproduce next year, then we won't see, or, you know, the summer or whatever, we won't see an increase in the population. The reason is, um, in these ar arid environments, deer, uh, mule deer specifically, they don't reproduce in their first year of life. Mm -hmm. So in other states, the northern states and things like that, you'll see um, young of the year fawns from this year or year and a half year old fawns reproducing uh, because they have much better nutrition and moisture and things like that. Mm -hmm. Deer here don't typically reproduce till they're about two and a half years old. So it's a long-winded way of saying <laughs> that you need two to three years of good rainfall in order to see the populations really change course and start to start to rebound. So if we don't get good rains this year, last year's rains will be kind of for naught. Okay, that makes sense. And what, what are some of the primary factors that affect deer population here in Mexico. Yeah, drought. Drought's the biggest thing. Um, again, that goes back to the reproductive effort and reproductive success of the does. Um, so if we don't have the rainfalls, we won't we won't see populations increase. So drought drought is, in my opinion, number one. Um, <clears throat> the second thing is long term habitat change. So everybody talks about the heyday of the 1960s, and that's throughout the West. They talk about it. The mule deer heyday was. 1960 to 70. At that time, um, we weren't suppressing fire as much as we do now. There was a lot of logging on the landscape, so um, a lot of forests were being reset to earlier stages, which is important for deer, and same with the fire. And then also there was wide-scale, landscape-scale and west-wide-scale um, predator erad eradication. And so um, all three of those things combined at that time to really boost the deer population. So now 
we we suppress fires a lot more readily than we had previously. We're much more effective at it. Not we, you and I, um, landscape man, uh, land managers and things like that are, uh, because we need to protect life and property, obviously. Um, and we don't have as wide scale of logging. And so all that equates to the habitat changing and the forest maturing to a state that isn't usable for deer or as usable for deer. So we really need those fires. Uh, we need early early successional stages of forests in order to see populations really benefit from that because really those early successional habitat types are what the deer need for their forage and hiding cover and things of that nature. So um, kind of rambling, but the, the long-term habitat change is important um, and is, is one of the, uh, I don't want to say threats because that's kind of doom and gloom, but one of the bigger issues impacting deer. Um, overuse of vegetation, be it from cattle and livestock, um, um, maybe elk here and there, but, but more so in my opinion would be cattle and livestock. Uh, the overuse of vegetation takes off the forage for the deer and the hiding cover for the deer, and so they just can't get as much to, to really rebound. Um, and, and then with habitat change, there's a lot of exotic invasive plants in the state. Um, junipers are not exotics, but they are invasive and they take away uh, they're not usable by deer, not as usable by deer. Um, cheatgrass is, isn't as bad in New Mexico. It's really bad in other states. Um, but in the northern part of the state, cheatgrass can impact the vegetation on the ground. The deer can't eat cheatgrass. It's an exotic invasive. Um, so that, that can impact what habitat and what, what plants are there for, for the deer to use. Um, and in predators, if... Uh, if, if populations are low enough such that deer can't out reproduce the predation, mm -hmm. they can get in a predator pit. Um, and so, you know, they might throw fawns on the ground, but then the predators, predators, um, you know, eat them before they're able to, to mature and reproduce. And, and so that's where, in my opinion, you kind of need more rainfall because then they can throw more fawns on the ground and kind of the rainfall help those fawns survive and get over that predator pit. So, um, very long-winded ways of, of, <laughs> of talking about the different things that impact deer populations in our state. Well, I know that you're part of the uh, Mule Deer Working Group, um, which uh, involves a lot of people from across Western United States and also uh, Western Canada. What, how, how are things going with that group? And uh, as you look at New Mexico, uh, how do we compare to some of the uh, surrounding states in terms of our deer population? Sure. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, I am part of the Mule Deer Working Group. The Mule Deer Working Group is um, it's a, a group of biologists, deer biologists from throughout the West. Um, there's one representative from each state, a deer biologist from each state in, in Canadian province. That work, We sit on this group and we come together to, to have a collaborative approach to finding solutions for black-tailed and mule deer management in the West. We talk about different issues that we face in our states um, that and things that maybe we've gone through or foresee going through and, and uh, talk about what other states have done to address this issue, if they've come across these issues, um, politically, biologically, all of that. And it's a really fun group to be part of. Some of the uh, premier deer minds in the West um, are, are on this group. And it's, a, it's an honor to be a member of this group. And um, <clears throat> when it comes to how we are doing in relation to other states, um, I would probably, when I think about it, I liken us most closely to Arizona in um, uh, vegetation, habitat type, uh, weather patterns, and things like that. And so uh, we have very similar issues. For instance, Arizona doesn't get winter die off. We don't generally get winter die off. We lose our fawns and our deer populations in the summertime during the drought, like I mentioned earlier. Um, so, so we're you know, comparable to them in regards to population trajectories and things of that nature. I don't know what Arizona's overall population is off the top of my head, um, but, but we, we generally have similar trends. And our neighbors, it, it kind of, the comparisons kind of fall apart after that because once you get up to the Chama area and hit that Colorado border, the habitat the moisture regime, the weather patterns, everything just changes pretty dramatically. And so it's hard to compare 
us to say Colorado or us to Utah. We're really comparing apples to oranges there. Um, Colorado and Utah and, and the rest of the northern states, they lose their deer populations in the wintertime. Most of them are going through a very severe winter right now. Um, they're having to enact emergency feeding, emergency baiting, and things like that to, to help address some issues. Um, those deer, a lot of them are not going to survive the winter, um, and you know it'll, the population will take a hit for a few years. We just don't see the winter die off here. And... Uh, <clears throat> because they get more moisture and their vegetation's a little more um, lush and, and robust there's there's summer and spring spring and summer um, they don't they don't lose the deer there they they produce a lot of fawns um, and it, it's just, it's just kind of hard to compare for instance uh, a comparison is when we survey deer populations and we'll talk about it here in a little bit uh, we want to see over 35 or 40 fawns per hundred does and to mm -hmm. us that's stable and growing um, when they survey, the northern states survey, if they get 60 or lower fawns per hundred does, maybe they want to see 70 even, um, then that, that causes concern for them because they know that they're going to lose a lot of those fawns toward the end of that winter. So again, it's kind of, it's kind of hard to compare, um, our, us to neighboring states. Texas, they have a real robust mule deer population. There, uh, a lot of private land there. Um, but they have a good, a robust mule deer population. They have similar weather patterns to us. Their habitat's a little bit different. Um, mm -hmm. But but yeah, they, I'd say us, Arizona and, and Texas, we kind of all fluctuate similarly. So um, if I can put a plug in with the mule deer working group, um, we we all got together. Uh, Jim Heffelfinger's the chair of, it, of the mule deer working group and he had a vision about four or five years ago to rewrite what we call the Walmo book. And the Walmo book was written in the 1960s, I want to say 67 or maybe 69. And at that time, it was the premier book published published for anything mule and black-tailed deer related. Um, it might be the 70s. Either way, it's been a while. Um, and so Jim wanted to update that book because there's been 40 years of research that's occurred since then. And so um, I'm honored to be a part of this book. Over, over 80 authors, uh, 23 chapters, we wrote a book. Uh, it's entitled uh, Ecology and Management of black and Mule Deer of North America. And so that's going to be hitting the streets in May, and that's going to have the most recent research published in there, the most recent uh, you know, cutting-edge information, uh, population modeling, survey techniques, things like that. And that'll all be in there. It's a real big book. Um, I wrote the chapter on the Southwest deserts, so it encompasses us, Texas, Arizona, a little bit of California, a little bit of, of uh, Utah, and then Mexico, but, you know, mm -hmm. that ecosystem. So uh, that'll be coming out May 15th. It'll be uh, a really good tool for wildlife managers and, uh, and deer managers throughout the West. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, super, super excited for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely some uh, some good work that, that you all have uh, gotten together and uh, worked hard to uh, to put together. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So what are some of the uh, real deer hunting hotspots in this state? You know, there, there's obviously people who are always after the the biggest buck. Where, where might they find that here? Yeah, um, I say this a lot, and I, I do truly believe it. Um, folks may not believe it. They may throw something at the screen when they hear me say this, but uh, <laughs> I do truly believe that you can shoot a record book buck in any unit in the state. Um, I've seen them. I haven't been. I've been in every unit, but I haven't been like observed all the deer in every unit. So I haven't necessarily seen a hundred eighty inch buck in every unit. Uh, that being said, I've seen pictures of deer coming out from every unit that, that top that 180 mark and even better. Um, so I really do think you can get a Boone and Crockett buck or better uh, anywhere in the state. Now there are some more likely units. Um, you know, 33 is a good unit. It's the sand, kind of sand hill country. It's rolling sand hill with Shinnery Oak. Um, and that's a known spot for big bucks. It's just real productive down there. Um, two C is always a good spot in those areas up around, uh, the units up around, say, Farmington and Chama, um, seen some giant bucks up there. And there's a lot of deer. Um, they do migrate out of Colorado into those units, so some of the later hunts gets some of those Colorado deer. The earlier hunts, you're hunting more New Mexico residents. 
Um, but but they they all all those ones are only getting Chamba and Farmington. They they can produce some real big bucks. Um, unit forty five just here east of Santa Fe. Um, I I've been shocked at the number of deer and at the size of deer I've seen in there. It's hard hunting. You, you mm-hmm. get up to uh, twelve almost thirteen thousand feet, uh, and I've seen some bucks in those alpine basins uh, that are that are giants. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you know so it's a steep country and rugged and things like that. But there are a lot of a lot of good deer in there. When it comes to cows, deer unit twenty seven is a real good, real good one known for some big bucks and mule deer. Um, the burrows and just unit twenty three in general for cows, white tailed deer. And then um, I'm hearing that the other units around there twenty one, twenty four, uh, they're also good units to to get a nice cows, white tailed deer. I haven't hunted them myself, um, but a lot of my friends do, and mm-hmm. and they say there, there's a decent amount down there, good amount down there. Uh, but yeah, twenty three and twenty seven are, are pretty well known ones for for some big bucks. Mm-hmm. What kind of success rates are you typically hearing from from hunters? Um, you know, I, I know that uh, archery hunts tend to be up over fifty percent, but also like, what are the uh, what are the success rates for uh, rifle and muzzleloader hunts? Yeah, it, it really depends on the type of hunt. So we have a standard hunt and we have the quality hunt. Um, <clears throat> a standard hunt, I, I tend to think of them as opportunity hunts. It, it gives us an opportunity to go hunting. Again, you can shoot a big buck. Um, there's, there's still high success rates in them, uh, but we do tend to put out more tags in those standard type hunts. Then we have quality hunts, and a quality hunt is... Um, a hunt that's has a more opportune time period potentially it has a combination of one of the so next several things i'm going to list off more opportune time period so maybe a little later in the year a little closer to the rut mm-hmm. a little cooler so the bucks will be on their feet a little bit longer through the day um, we may have reduced tags in there so you're not competing with your your neighbor for a deer you know when you see one you glass one up you can actually go stalk it without having to worry about bumping into another person potentially um, so we have, you know, fewer tags, maybe more opportune time period. And, and with that, it also culminates into, since the harvest intensity is less, it culminates into more, more bucks on the landscape and a more equal range of age classes. So you might actually see seven and a half, eight and a half year old buck who's sporting some giant antlers. Whereas in a standard unit, um, although those bucks do exist, the age class might be closer to that four and a half, five and a half year. So to get to your question, um, rifle hunts in the standard units uh, are usually around 30%. Um, on the quality units, we're seeing 50 to 60%. I've seen 80% in oh, some. Wow. Um, and, and again, that goes back to a combination of the different things I was just talking about. Uh, for muzzleloader hunts, they're very, very similar currently, very, very similar to the rifle success. Um, and that, again, goes to one of the reasons why we took scopes off of muzzleloaders is because basically a muzzleloader was a one-shot rifle and people were able to shoot five, 600 yards. Um, so I don't know what the success rate will do now that we've removed scopes on muzzleloaders this year. It'll be interesting to look at. We expect it'll go down. Um, so I'll, I'll, we'll find that out here in uh, about a year from now, uh, but it had been had been about thirty percent for standard hunts, about fifty percent for quality hunts, and then when it comes to archery hunting, um, for the standard hunts, and when you, when I say standard, um, t- typically most of those are the September hunts, so it's hot, mm-hmm. they're they're bedded down earlier, and they're not close to rut. Um, that's about twenty percent success rate for the standards, and then for the quality hunts, uh, about thirty to thirty five percent success rates. Mm-hmm. So if you want a challenge, try an archery. Hunt. Right. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So if for for people looking to apply for for a draw hunt this year, what are some tips that you might have for them as they go into the draw? Yeah. Um, do your homework. I know maybe a lot of out of state hunters are going to be watching this show this show here today. Um, give me a call. Give a, a biologist or a game warden a call. Um, talk about the different units in that region, um, find out what type of attributes, what type of habitat there is, what type of uh, terrain there is in that unit, uh, what type of hunt you can expect. So, so do your homework. Don't just, 
don't just look at a map and, and blindly select a couple units because they're closer to you or uh, or you read about it on Monster Muleys or something like that. Mm-hmm. Like, like, do your homework, give us a call. We can tell you kind of what you can expect in that unit as far as number of deer to see, hunter, hunter intensity, hunter density, um, and, and things of that nature, even how much public land there is in the unit and those sorts of things. So, yeah, give us a shout. Check out our website. Look at the hunting prospects that you just talked about a few minutes ago um, and see, you know, see – what type of hunt you're looking for? Are you wanting to, are you wanting to hunt close to timberline, do a backpack seven day or five day hunt or whatever close to timberline, or do you prefer some uh, amenities of town? You know where you maybe stay in a hotel and drive out to your unit each day or whatever. Um, and we can even help you as far as camping opportunities in the unit and, and those sorts of things. So yeah, give us a call. Um, <clears throat> again, I mentioned. Uh, some, some of those different hunting forums. Um, read up on those, see what folks say as far as what you can expect when it comes to terrain and habitat, weather patterns, typically for each year and those sorts of things. So um, really those are, the, those are the big tips that I have for, for when you're thinking about applying. Mm-hmm. And you mentioned surveys earlier. Um, what kind of data is the, is the department looking to get out of those? And- um, what are you kind of hoping to see when you look at those fawn to doe and buck to doe ratios? Sure. So um, we fly surveys every year. We've done it, golly, since prior to the 90s, I bet. Um, definitely every year since the 90s uh, and early 2000s. But we fly, uh, fly surveys every year. We can't fly the whole state. It's just too big of a state. So we select units that are representative of that area that get a representative rainfall pattern or representative habitat types and things like that and we we select um, I'm usually able to survey like 13 to 16 units within a year Uh, and we do that in December um, and we're looking when we're flying we're looking at total numbers that we see we we can't see them all obviously uh, so we can only fly select areas but we're looking at total numbers uh, just just general loose trends in total numbers more so to your question, we're looking at the buck to doe and fawn to doe ratios. We're seeing if the fawn to doe ratios are appropriate for a sustained population. We're not just looking at one year as a snapshot in time, we're looking at trends over a couple of years. Um, and we generally want to see fawn to doe ratios above 35 fawns per 100 does. Um, and again, that when we see that, when we see 35, we think, okay, that population is stable uh, if it bounces around that 35. Fonds per hundred does, when it gets up to forty, maybe fifty, uh, fonts per hundred does, then we think, okay, this population is starting to starting to increase, and so we we we, throughout the state, we, everybody wants to see deer increase, so we really mm-hmm. want to see forty to fifty mm-hmm. fonts per hundred does each year. We're also looking at buck to doe ratios, and that's telling us what type of hunting opportunity there is on the landscape. Are we hitting our targets? Are we are we, um, are the number of bucks on the landscape providing the hunting opportunity that we're hoping to see. Um, and so that kind of depends on if it's a standard hunt or a quality hunt. On standard hunts, I, I generally want to see about 25 bucks per hundred does mm-hmm. on standard hunts. On quality hunts, I usually want to see 30 to 40 bucks per hundred does. And when you get that 30 to 40 bucks per hundred does, you generally start having wider age, age classes of bucks on the landscape. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, that's kind of that's kind of what we're looking at for that. And if I can put a plug in here, uh, when it comes to bucks per per hundred does, um, <clears throat> the number of bucks on the landscape does not matter when it comes to population trajectories. Mm-hmm. It do, does not matter how many bucks are there, uh, unless unless it falls below ten bucks per hundred does, right. which doesn't happen. Uh, <clears throat> but as long as there's more than ten bucks per hundred does every doe in that unit in that area is getting bred every year right. so removing bucks from the landscape doesn't impact how the population changes or the trajectory of the population it it just impacts the hunting opportunities that are available right so um again in my lifetime i've never seen buck to doe populations really below 15 bucks per hundred does and that was mm-hmm. up in washington when i was up there um, in a general unit over the counter tags and stuff and and it was just it was still a very very productive unit 
Um, here we're usually around, in the standard hunts, we're almost always above 20 bucks per 100 does. In the quality hunts, um, I mean, I have to go and look, but it's usually in that 35 bucks per 100 does. Mm -hmm. I've seen 50 bucks per 100 does, but um, it's usually around that 35 bucks per 100 does. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's uh, obviously one buck can, can breed multiple does. Mm -hmm. So the, the buck numbers aren't, aren't quite as important to the sustainability of the population. Exactly, 100% correct, mm -hmm. yep, yeah. As far as migratory patterns, what are some of the more kind of intriguing migratory patterns that you see in, in New Mexico? Yeah, and this is, this is an exciting topic for me also. Um, so, so WAFWA, Western Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies, all the wildlife agencies in the West are, are part of WAFWA, um, formed recently a, a migration working group, and I'm the chair of the migration working group, similar to the mule deer working group. Uh, we get together and we talk about migration issues and topics and things like that. So it's a um, it's a it's a fun topic for me. It's it's really cool to hang some collars on some deer, elk, or pronghorn and see how they move throughout the landscape and, and across our state. Um, <clears throat> one of the more unique ones. Uh, it's a well known herd that migrates out of Colorado, out of the San Juans. It goes. I mean, some of those deer even go up in the summer near like Wolf Creek ski area. And then they'll come down in their winter on the Rosa Mesa up near Navajo Lake in Unit 2B. Um, and that's, I mean, that's a 30 to, depending on which deer, 30 to 50 mile migration every year. They come down in the, in the fall and go back in the summer or spring. Uh, they complete that migration within about a week's time. Oh, wow. And it's consistent every year. They always start around uh, like the third week of October, start migrating out of the, out of the mountains and, and come on their winter range within a week or so, like about a week, seven, eight days. Um, so a super long travel uh, um, over a short period of time. And then one thing that I think is super cool about deer, especially mule deer, is they have real strong fidelity to their migration routes. So the doe will migrate this every year, her fawn will migrate that every year, that fawn's fawn will migrate every year. And so really like what this doe does really impacts what generations down the line do. And so they're just really consistent with that migration. I mean, they'll even walk the same trails. It's super, super cool in my opinion. So that Rosa one um, is, is one of the more well-known ones in the state. A lot of people talk about it. It's been researched for a while. Um, we also, back in 2021, was it 2021? Um, it might've been 20, back in 2020. We started collaring some deer uh, around Chama on the Rio Chama Wildlife Management Area. And in 2021, we expanded it over to uh, around the Cuesta area, but we were specifically looking at migration routes. And the Rio Chama deer, they actually have two migration routes. They come and they winter on Rio Chama or just south of it, on private land just south of it. And a lot of them will, will go up north, they'll, they'll skirt Heron Lake and go up just west of Chama and then up into the San Juan Mountains in Colorado, and that's about a 20 mile, 25 mile migration. Um, <clears throat> and then from that same herd, that same wintering herd, some of these deer will go east up into, say, you know, 51 uh, and 52, and they'll, they'll uh, well, summer up around the um, uh, uh, Continental Divide. Mm -hmm. uh, just just east of the Rio Chama, and so the winter the same spot, two different migration routes, and it's super cool with it with those two segments of that herd. They actually both segments migrate through the same like half mile, not not through the same half mile spot, but they both pinch down to like a half mile pinch point, mm -hmm. uh, going up one around Heron Lake, and then one going across an ice or not, uh, Highway sixty four. Uh, heading east, but it, it's cool to see how they how they move and um, some of those maps are now published. Actually, one is published in the uh, Ungulate Migrations of the West, and you can look at that. Just Google Ungulate Migrations of the West, and you can see mm -hmm. that migration route. I can probably share it with you too if you want to get going. That's a fun one. I really like those two herds, uh, just because of the distance that they cover within a year. And again, mm -hmm. that that Rio Chama herd, it, it completes that migration within a couple weeks or a week time. Uh, and then they go back about the same time every year. And then the rest of the state, um, not the rest, what we know about through, through the rest of the state, uh, it's more of an elevational migration. Mm -hmm. So in the San Cristobal's outside of Cuesta, 
uh, they might summer, <clears throat> excuse me, outside of Cuesta, but then they'll migrate more on an elevational gradient and, and summer up in the high peaks of the San Cristobal's and then get pushed down as the snow pushes them down. And then it'll just kind of ping pong back and forth. Okay, the snow's a little too deep here for me to move at a reasonable pace to evade predators and get, get what I need for energy and stuff. So I'm gonna go a little bit lower. Mm -hmm. Maybe that snow will melt, maybe it'll go a little bit higher. And then they kind of like ping pong back and forth. Um, <clears throat> and then and then when the snow fully clears, then they'll go up again in summer in the high country. But that's a fun one. Um, and then most of the, a lot of the other mountain populations do similar you know the ones out here um and you know 45 we don't have collars on them but i expect them to do very similar just kind of mm -hmm. go up and down based on snow level yeah go up go up a thousand feet when it's warmer come down a thousand feet when when the snow gets too deep yeah yeah exactly yep <clears throat> yeah it's, it's super cool i think it's it's real fun just seeing the collars you know um kind of pulling it up on a map and being like, oh shoot, these deer are here now and a week and a half ago they were there. And you just, it's kind of, oh, it's just real interesting, real mm -hmm. fun to see what they do. And it helps guide our habitat management. It helps us manage better, you know, uh, how many tags we might put in certain units and things mm -hmm. like that too. Yeah, this is how many deer that are going to be in this, in this area at this time of year versus a month from now they're all going to be here. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, so super cool. And what are some of the, the key differences for people debating whether they want to apply for a public land hunt or, or a private land hunt? And also, kind of within those private land hunts, I know that the, uh, the Lindreth uh, private land hunts are, are a little bit different from, from your standard private land hunt. Yeah, um, my recommendation is unless you know a landowner that will let you hunt deer, on his property or his or her property, go ahead and apply for the public hunts. The difference is um, a public hunt, public draw hunt is what's published in our rule book. Um, when you draw that tag, you can hunt anywhere in the unit that has publicly accessible public land or any private land with written permission. Um, and we, when we allocate those tags, I look at how much available public land there is in there so we're not overcrowding hunters. Uh, mm -hmm. So there is plenty of public land for those public draw hunters. Um, <clears throat> the private tags, we don't restrict the number of tags that go out on private land. Um, you can get them over the counter, you know, go to Walmart, come here to our office and pick them up. Uh, the difference is with that private land tag, in order to be able to legally hunt it, you have to know somebody who's gonna give you written permission to hunt their private deeded acres. The key difference for that private tag is it's only valid on private deeded acres that you have written permission for. So you have that private tag, you can't go hunt a national forest or anything like that. You have to stick to that private land. Um, so throughout the state, except for the Lindworth hunts, which you, which you mentioned, throughout the state, uh, private land tags are over the counter. When you get to the Lindworth hunts, that's unit 2A, 2B, 2C, 4, and 5A. That's what we call the Lindworth hunts. In order to get a private land tag there, we do actually restrict the number of tags that we give on private land in those five units. In order to get a tag, you have to know a landowner or um, uh, an outfitter who has hunting access to that property, and you have to obtain a code from him. That code, what that does is it allows you to apply for that private land hunt. And so, um, <clears throat> so basically, you know, you call, if you have a buddy in say unit, uh, 5A. And, and he says, hey, you know, I got some property, come hunt it this year. Well, you can't just go out and hunt it. You have to, you have to get that code from him, which he obtains from us. And then you, you go in and you apply for that hunt. And so I want to say in unit 5A, I want to say we get, we have about 230 private land tags. Mm -hmm. And so you'd have to be one of the lucky hunters to draw one of those 230 tags to be able mm -hmm. to hunt there. The reason we did that, um, shoot, that was before I got here, uh, but the reason we did that was because there had been chronic poaching issues up in that area in those five units, um, and, and the landowners actually came to the department and said, hey, we want to start restricting who's on our property. We want to know, mm -hmm. we, want, we want to know, we want to have a little more control over who's actually coming out here and hunting because there are, and there's still poaching issues, but mm -hmm. um, it has curtailed it. But they want. They said the poaching issues are too too great. We want to have a little more restriction, and so that's what that's what we did. I've been here seven years. It had already been here 
probably five years before I got here or something of that nature. Um, and so, yeah, to, to hunt those winter hunts, get a hunt card from, from your landowner buddy, from your outfitter buddy who has hunting access there. So, yeah. So when you look at antlerless hunts, what, what is the main purpose of, of those antlerless hunts? And also it seems like those hunts are mainly uh, geared toward youth hunters. Yeah, so <clears throat> the main purpose of antlerless hunts is to address an issue, a localized issue with deer populations in that area. Um, a, a, generally a, a deer human type conflict, whether it's Silver City hunts where we have antlerless hunts that address an overpopulation, which results in deer vehicle collisions or eating you know, um, ornamental shrubs and gardens and things like that. Um, and around the Roswell area, uh, it's more to address depredations on croplands and aglands. Um, and so we give those antlerless tags, allocate antlerless tags, in order to address that, that overpopulation um, to, help, to help reduce it to a more manageable level. Um, in, in the arid, and I'll get to your youth question in a second, in the arid, New Mexico, um, antlerless harvest is really detrimental to, to deer population growth, which is why we don't have antlerless hunts in other parts of the state, um, in areas that there aren't issues, uh, and, and why it's generally dedicated toward youths. And it's not just New Mexico, Arizona, Texas, things like that, like, because it is arid, because of that reproductive success I talked about earlier. Um, increasing, even... Like a, let's, I read it here, a 5 to 10% increase in adult female mortality can cause your population to go really, really low. It can reduce populations by like 15, 20%, just by, just by increasing mortality 5 to 10%. So mm -hmm. um, we try to be real um, conservative on, on doe harvest because we, you know, like I said earlier, we want in most parts of the state deer populations to grow. Mm -hmm. The reason that it's mostly geared toward youths is just to provide an opportunity. They're generally, again, like on and around ag fields. Um, a lot of a lot of uh, crop growers do allow those hunters onto their property, and so um, it might be shooting out of a blind or out of a stand. A doe that's standing in an ag field that comes out. It's it's not. It's a hunting opportunity for youths. We're trying to recruit more youths into mm -hmm. the sport, uh, and I wouldn't say it's like. It's not an easy hunt. No hunts are easy, right? Right. But it's not the most challenging hunt. It's more of a, um, a, a hunt to get youths excited. They're going to see a bunch of deer. They're going to get a chance to shoot one, shoot at one, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's generally why we allocate them toward um, uh, toward youths. Now, we do have, I think, 15 tags uh, around Roswell that are allocated toward you and I, you know, adult hunters, or mm -hmm. youths can do them also. Um, and that's just another opportunity thing, but in general, we want, we want them, they generally go toward youths in our state. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned trying to recruit youth hunters by, by providing them that opportunity. Do you tend to see an increase among those hunters who have had that opportunity earlier in life to, that, that they tend to, to bounce back and keep, um, at least applying for the drawer, if, if nothing else? Yeah, no, I'm not the right one to, to answer that. Um, that's not really in my area of expertise. Um, <clears throat> anecdotally, I'd say 100%. Um, I hunt today. I'm an, I'm an avid hunter because I went out with my dad and my grandpa when I was mm -hmm. a young kid. Um, <clears throat> I may have, I, I think I started hunting with them when I was eight. I shot my first deer when I was 12. Um, <clears throat> that being said, I went out with them all, as much as I could. I'd get upset if I couldn't go out hunting with them, <laughs> but it was cause I was out there with them. They shot a deer or two, a turkey or two. Uh, we were, I was playing the game with them. I was interacting with the turkeys. I was uh, seeing a bunch of deer with them and those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. And that early experience definitely got me hooked. And then once I killed my first deer, um, and we all know what type of experience that can be. It's emotional, it's happy, it's sad, it's all the emotions above. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> but when I got my first deer, and I, you know, went home and, and thought about it a little more and stuff. And it's like, man, I got, I got, I got to keep doing this. Right yeah. on 12. It, it kind of, kind of gave you the bug a little bit. It did. Yeah, it did. And so, 
Um, again, I'm not the right one. I don't study this field, but the folks who do study it say that that early introduction, early experience is paramount to having that lifelong enjoyment, lifelong involvement of whatever sport it might be, whatever activity it might be, hunting being the same thing. So when you look at New Mexico's uh, deer population, what are some of the, the primary concerns that you see disease-wise? I, I know that obviously uh, chronic wasting disease is a, is a big one that, uh, that everybody talks about. Yeah, that, that in my opinion is the biggest. Um, CW, chronic wasting disease or CWD is, is always fatal. It's a neurological disease. Um, it impacts the prions in the, in the neurological system. Um, there is not a cure for it, so when a deer is infected with it, uh, they will die from it. That being said, um, it, in our state currently, we haven't seen population level impacts from it. Um, prevalence rates in areas where we know it exists currently is about three to five percent prevalence rates, which is super low. Uh, Wyoming and Colorado, in their <clears throat> their big areas, their prevalence rates are up. Um, Golly, I, I think Andy told me just recently uh, about 50% in some areas, maybe 45 in oh, some wow. of the big areas. So it, the prevalence rates is super high. Mm -hmm. um, we don't have it to that degree here in New Mexico that we know of. We are trying to increase uh, monitoring and, and testing for it. We are trying to expand our sampling throughout the state. Currently, we only know about it in Units 19, which is White Sands. Uh, units 34, down around Rudoso and um, you know 29 I feel like there's one more that I'm not thinking of no I think it's those three units anyways it's page 37 of the rule book that it says it mm -hmm. um, but it, so far it's been contained in that area I don't want to say contained it hasn't spread out of that area mm -hmm. that we know of that being said it's been detected within a couple miles of our border in Texas and in Colorado mm -hmm. and that Rosa herd that I talked about um, it hasn't been detected in that herd but one of the deer that comes in contact with that herd was positive for CWD a couple years ago. So conceivably, mm -hmm. it is in other parts of our state. We just haven't found it. That's why we're trying to increase our testing. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> again, it, it doesn't have currently population level impacts in our state, but it very well could. Um, the bucks carry it more readily, and the older bucks are more likely to, to, have, to be infected with CWD. And so there are some management actions you can take to help address it but we're not getting rid of it um so so we're trying we would currently if we had a huge outbreak or an issue we would currently just try to target harvest to help manage and help lower the prevalence rates mm -hmm. um, again that's the big one folks uh look at page 37 of the rule book this year uh we want all samples that we can get from both deer and elk mm -hmm. um, there are incentives for turning in your samples you can get put into a, a, a supplementary draw for elk tag in the Via Vidal, Via Vidal? Yeah. or an oryx tag so just by just by shooting an animal and bringing it to an office so we can pull a sample mm -hmm. you get another chance at a, at a really sweet hunt so mm -hmm. uh, we want all samples that we can get and, and help increase our testing um, other diseases that that we have in New Mexico uh, another big one is epizootic hemorrhagic disease EHD it presents similarly to blue tongue in fact a lot of people do call it blue tongue um, that can have population level impacts it usually it usually comes on at the end of summer um, we had an outbreak of it in 2018 down in the southeast part of the state there's nothing you can do about it nothing anybody can do about it it's spread by uh, biting midges and, and, and uh, gnats that gather around water sources. Deer obviously need to come to water, especially in the summertime. Um, they come in contact with these, these insects that are gnats that carry it. They get bit, they get this, this blue tongue EHD. It's not always fatal. A lot of times it is, it's not always. Uh, they can get over it, but um, what, what you'll start seeing <clears throat> is you'll start seeing carcasses around water sources. And that's how we find out about it. We try to pick up a carcass, get a test and they're like oh yeah it's CHD mm -hmm. um, so that's another big one if it does get severe enough it can impact excuse me if it does get severe enough it can impact a population um, we did lose a few deer in the southeast a couple years ago but um, I wouldn't say it was a population level impact it just it did we did see a decent number die off that year
Mm. Just more kind of isolated cases than, than you would typically see. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, you'll see it isolated, like you said, exactly. Um, in a, you know, a, an area here, maybe a 10 square mile area here, but then you won't necessarily see it 20 miles that direction. Mm -hmm. um, although it could be, it's just, it's more pocketed, like you're saying. Right. Um, so yeah, those are the two big ones, especially the ones that kill deer, uh, CWD and EHD. Um, we do, I get calls every year, hey, I shot this deer, it has these disgusting maggots in its nose mm -hmm. uh, and its mouth, it is, it's very gross, you know, what's going on with it, is it safe to eat? Those are nasal bot flies. It's actually, um, it's actually probably in every deer you've ever shot, you just don't always see it because it's not always, mm -hmm. uh, aren't always enough to, to detect it, but, or for us to see it. Um, just by looking in the mouth, but it's it's a, a natural thing. It doesn't hurt them. It might be a slight irritant. You might see them coughing or sneezing because it tickles. Um, mm. But it's it's a little a fly that it lays its eggs. I think in the feces uh, and in the deer as they're eating, you know, the forbs and grasses and or forbs and shrubs. Um, they get those those eggs, ingest them or inhale them. Mm. Gets in the back of their throat and they advance to the the larvae stage which look, is those little maggot looking things or little white white worms uh, they'll eventually develop back into the flies and the cycle starts again it is gross yeah <laughs> i've shot a deer or two that have them and you kind of like Ugh. but um it, it doesn't hurt them doesn't hurt the meat uh perfectly fine perfectly safe and natural and those sorts of things so and then the other thing I'll get periodically, and you might have seen it, other folks here might have seen it, is uh, cutaneous fibromas. Um, they look like warts on the mm -hmm. skin. Have you seen that before, pictures mm -hmm. of it? Yeah, and it's just um, just like a wart. It can be really anywhere on the skin, sometimes around the eyes, mouth, uh, anywhere else. It looks gross, um, doesn't hurt the meat, doesn't hurt the animal unless it gets to a place where it impacts their eating or detection of predators and those sorts of things. But mm -hmm. it's just a skin... Uh, a skin, a skin wart um, that that doesn't get into the meat or anything. So that animal would be safe to harvest. It'd be safe to eat. It just would not take the best picture. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, might might not be the the one that you want to have mounted or anything right. like that. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> well, um, is there anything else that that you would like to add? Any last words of wisdom for uh, for anybody wanting to hunt deer in New Mexico this year? Uh, I'd say good luck in the draw. Do your homework. Um, give us a call. Say, hey, I'm thinking about this. I want this type of hunt. Um, I've always wanted to. I've always wanted to hunt this habitat. I've always wanted to hunt New Mexico. What do you suggest for me? In state, out of state, whatever. Um, I have this idea of a western hunt in my head. What's your thoughts on it? Uh, give us a call. Do your homework ahead of time. When you get a tag, um, I tell this to everybody, but. Uh, Although animals can be spotted and, and feasibly harvested within close proximity to a road, um, <clears throat> my suggestion is get off the road. Don't be afraid to hike even a mile, even a half mile off the road, over that ridge, uh, just getting out and hiking a little bit um, will increase your chances dramatically of getting an animal. You'll be amazed at the number of animals you see when you get away from the roads. And a lot of people, again, it, it is a viable way to hunt. A lot of people kill deer and elk every year by driving roads and looking for them and then getting off the road and shooting. Um, so it, it does happen, but your your success rates and your opportunities increase once you start putting a little, burning a little boot leather, boot mm -hmm. rubber. <laughs> well, thanks so much for your time. Um, yeah, some great information and uh, hopefully, uh, uh, the people applying for the draw can uh, can get something out of it and uh, help guide their uh, their decisions and uh, yeah it should be uh, some valuable information for them um, again a uh, couple major deadlines coming up with uh, the big draw deadline coming up on March 22nd 5 o'clock um, I've mentioned it in other videos and I'll mention it again that it if you're still in the system at five o'clock on March 22nd and you haven't completed your uh, your application, the system's gonna kick you out and your uh, dry application will not be accepted. Um, so give yourself plenty of time to complete that, that application. Uh, 
do your best to not wait until the last minute. Uh, also that day is the deadline for all of the deer, elk, pronghorn, and turkey uh, harvest reports. Those are a requirement. Um, if you don't get those in, then your dry applications will be rejected. Um, and April 7th is the deadline for your harvest reports for Barbary, Ibex, Javelina, and Oryx. So make sure that you get those in. Um, other episodes in this series are available in our Drawing Your Path to Success playlist on YouTube. Uh, so check that out. You can look at any past episodes. That's also where any uh, future episodes will also end up. And our next episode, um, for those of you who are uh, looking forward to the pronghorn presentation, that's actually going to be coming out next week, March 10th. We'll be with, uh, with Tony Opatz, our uh, pronghorn biologist. So for uh, Orin de Vouvier and our cameraman, Liam Phillips, I'm Darren Vaughn. Uh, good luck to you in the draw, and we'll see you next week.